Um, but yeah, I'm just going to pretty much dive in. Like Sarah said, I am a, a nonprofit communications specialist, and I've been doing this for about 15 years. And um, I'm just excited to share some of this stuff with you today. Um, so just very, very briefly, uh, I just wanted to touch on um, kind of who this webinar is for and what you'll learn. Um, you know, ideally, the communication strategy around Give Local Piedmont is part of a year round communication strategy. That's like the ideal situation. Uh, it's easier to talk to an audience that you have been cultivating all year than just sort of pop up and surprise them uh, when it's time to donate money. Of course, in reality, that's not always possible. And we don't all have resources for year round communication strategies. Uh, and even when we do, the best laid plans, all of that stuff. Uh, so any communication that you can do during the year is valuable and it really doesn't have to be as time intensive uh, or as online intensive as you might think. So my goal with this webinar is to sort of talk to everybody. So whether you have a team and you're doing this all year round and this is gonna slot in beautifully to your beautiful email calendar, or whether it's just you and you, you know, don't have time to start thinking about this until the week before. I'm hoping that everybody can kind of get at least something out of like parts of this. Uh, so some of this for some folks, it might not be relevant, but hopefully at other moments um, it will. So uh, I'm my hope is to that stuff that you hear about this, you can apply to your strategy throughout the year. Um, so we wanted to start off with a few just general internal workflow tips. And again, this is applicable to give local communication, but it's also applicable to just communication with your audience all year round. Um, so the first tip is that when possible, if there can just be one point person who is making final decisions and scheduling things, uh, that's always helpful to cut down on, uh, you know, redundant communication, also to establish a strong voice um, for your organization. Scheduling everything you can in advance, again, all year round uh, is just good advice. Most uh, social media tools, uh, including tools that let you send emails, have uh, tools that let you schedule posts. Um, so if you do have a team, Another tip is to just meet regularly and post consistently. So again, this is part of this idea that when you communicate all year round, it, it just hits a little bit nicer to get a, a fundraising ask. Um, I, again, ideally folks don't feel like they only hear from you when you're sort of fundraising. Um, and then the last tip is to take advantage of analytics. So analytics, uh, it's like a catch-all term that refers to sort of information about what you post, social media, emails, that kind of thing. So analytics are things like um, how many views did this video get? How many people opened this email? Uh, what time did everybody open this email? Um, how many people shared this image? That kind of thing. So those are analytics, and I'll say that word a few more times. Uh, looking at analytics helps you see what works and what doesn't work, and then you can adjust accordingly. So you notice that people are watching your videos, but they're not sharing your images. Maybe you make more videos, so on and so forth. Um, and most social media, again, most, most tools uh, for social media and email should uh, have ways that make it pretty easy to look at your analytics. Um, so I wanted to talk first about email. So I know some of you have email lists, some of you don't. Uh, for those of you that do, um, well, no, this is applicable to everybody. Uh, email software, you'll also hear referred to as CRM or customer relationship management. So for nonprofits, it's more like audience relationship management, um, but that's sort of the, the phrase for it. There are a lot of CRM options for nonprofits and a lot of them offer discounts for nonprofits. So Constant Contact, Kindful, Emma, um, those are just some examples of pretty solid CRMs. And this is software that lets you, um, you know, when you sort of are moving around on the internet and you see things that are like, join our list, sign up for email notifications. 
uh, that's what um, that is. So it's sort of a way to manage a list, send emails. Um, you can test emails, see how different emails perform and view analytics. Uh, so we'll talk again, just sort of briefly about email best practices, again, for those of you that uh, do operate email lists. Um, short and sweet, always best. Um, this is a, for me, this has been helpful. Um, asking yourself what you want the email to do instead of what you want it to say, or what you want the reader to do instead of what you want the reader to know. Um, it's kind of, it's surprising how much this can like change the way that you write emails. And it's surprising how uh, effective it can be. Um, really helps you kind of focus and be short and sweet and not sort of, because we all love our orgs and we all want to talk about our organizations and all the great work we're doing and how important we are and, you know, all these things. Uh, and sometimes the, the actual thing that you want the person to do can get lost. So generally speaking, it's easier said than done, but this is sort of a technique that has worked for me. Um, be descriptive in your subject line. That's not a hard and fast rule. Sometimes a little clickbait uh, can work uh, and sometimes it can. It really depends on who you're talking to. Um, but sometimes a little bit of a mysterious email subject can get people to open it. But again, what you want people to do, right? Like opening an email is great, but you want them to act actually do what you say in the email. Um, so a descriptive subject line helps them know, okay, this is a fundraising ask. I'm opening it. So I'm clearly open to giving you some money. Um, personalize the email. Uh, again, if you have a CRM, most of them have tools that let you sort of say, dear, um, and then you put in a little special code and it'll fill in the person's name if it has their name. Um, different CRMs have different sort of levels of complexity for that, but you can, for some of them, you can really personalize the emails. You can say, plug in the city that the person is in, that kind of thing. Um, you want all your emails to have a direct call to action. So an email, and this is sort of this similar to the tip below it about a clear ask to donate with a link. Um, an ideal email has one call to action, one thing you're wanting the person to do, and it's clearly laid out and it's, they see how to do it. Uh, and they're not sort of confused about what this email wants from them. Format for your audience. Uh, this refers to, um, again, most CRMs will sort of let you say, okay, if the person is on a phone, I want the email to look like this. If the person is on desktop, I want it to look like that. And it is always a good idea. I have a cat behind me being really bad, sorry. It's always a good idea to take advantage of those um, tools when you can so that the email looks how you want it to look for the people that open it. Um, and the last tip is sort of similar about sending tests to yourself to make sure that the email looks the way you want. It helps you catch typos, that kind of thing. So I know for me, sometimes I hate rereading what I wrote, but it's, it's good practice. Um, since I don't have a mouse and I can't click on the chat, I want to, I guess, pause and ask Sarah, is, are there questions or anything? Am I okay to keep going? Should I slow down? Yep, you're good. I don't see any okay. questions. Great. Okay. Uh, so then I want to talk again briefly about the ask itself uh, that you're putting in these emails specifically. Um, so generally speaking, people want to know that their donation is making an impact. Uh, the more you can communicate your impact to your audience, the more successful your fundraising is going to be. Uh, so if it's possible uh, to prime your audience, always do that. So you can think about your January to March email calendar as like, okay, in May, it's going to be give local. So in February, let's make sure that everybody knows about this cool thing that we did. And in March, let's make sure everybody knows about this cool thing that we're going to do. Um, again, not everybody has the resources, time intensive, all of that, all that stuff. So if it's not possible, it is what it is. But it, it, it can kind of 
pay for itself, right? It's kind of, it's a priority question. So if you're telling yourself, oh, I don't have any time at all. I don't have any time at all for this. On the one hand, fair enough. On the other, this kind of this, it's an investment that can pay off. Um, and so if there are ways to maybe deprioritize other things or shift resources around, it can really, really pay off. Um, and again, this is about this sort of thing of people want to see what they're, what they're doing and they don't want to just hear from you when you want something. They want to know uh, what you're out there doing. Um, so being specific about what donations allow your organization to do uh, is very valuable. So, and this again goes back to what do I want the reader to do and not what do I want to say? So rather than saying, you know, oh, please donate $20 because there's all this need and people don't have houses and it's getting cold and, you know, we're very important in the community, da, 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 da. You could say things like, you know, uh, 10 bucks is one coat, 20 bucks is three coats, um, 50 bucks is, you know, dinners for this many people. If the more you can quantify, the better. And again, this can fit into like a, a, a grant strategy, right? Like this is information that funders might wanna know. It's information that you can use all throughout the year. So again, it's an investment, but you can use this information uh, in other contexts throughout the year. And so it can really be worth it if you can really put some numbers down um, and convey really clearly to the audience what will happen if they give you money through Give Local. Um, so email segmentation, skinning a little into the email uh, weeds, but I think it's useful for those of you that have emails. Uh, so segmenting emails means splitting up your email list. So again, if you've got a CRM, if you've got email software, there should be tools that let you do this. You can create groups of people that have things in common. So you can look for people that have donated in the last year, people that um, clicked on an email in the last month and sort of things that indicate levels of engagement in your work. So you can create a group of people that are very highly engaged in your work. You can create groups of people that they're on the list, but they're maybe like seem maybe less engaged in your work. Uh, and the purpose of email segmentation is increasing the chances that you're gonna get an open or a click or a donation. Um, you don't wanna ask somebody who has not opened an email in a year or ever given you money for $150 um, or $250 or whatever it is. Um, you want this, so segmentation allows you to really speak specifically to specific audiences and give them what you think that they might want. You can also use uh, segmentation to test things like subject lines. Um, so in this case, you would not create groups that have things in common. You would create random test groups. This is less effective the smaller your list is, um, but you can sort of create a very small subgroup and send an email with a subject line to that group send the same email with a different subject line to another small group, wait some time, wait a day, see what happens. And then the winning subject line, send that one to the group as a whole. Again, if your list has 25 people on it, a little bit like less reliable results, but it's kind of cool. It's cool to play around with. It doesn't hurt. Um, so that's something that, and again, most uh, CRMs have tools that uh, make it relatively easy to do this. Most CRMs also regularly have webinars and training sessions and tutorials that you can take advantage of to learn how to do this stuff. Um, and so what you can do with segmentation is you can, like I said, update the ask based on the segment. So for non-donors, you ask them for five bucks. For recurring donors, you thank them way more than you're going to thank the non-donors first and tell them how great they are and how important they are. And then you ask them for a little bit more money. Um, and then one thing that I just always, always emphasize is volunteers. Volunteers are precious. You want to treat them as precious. Uh, if you're going to ask your volunteers for money, you, again, this sort of this comes back to communication throughout the year, right? Ideally, these people have already heard from you uh, about how great they are and how important they are. Um, and so now it, it hits a little bit better to be asked for money. Um, 
in some cases for me, I just, I keep volunteers in like special little bucket and I just don't bother them. Like unless, unless there's a, something really huge that I need them for. Um, because again, this is just a very, it's a precious group of people and you really want to, um, treat them with respect and respect how much they have uh, supported you. So that is what segmentation can do. Um, what and when, uh, when and what emails to send. So people ask a lot about what's the best hour, what's the best time, what's the best this, what's the best that. Uh, there's no hard and fast rule for any of this. It really depends on who you're talking to and testing can help you figure this stuff out. Um, try sending an email at 7 a.m. and then try sending an email at noon, see what happens. Um, but there are some sort of general guidelines for Give Local specifically about when to send emails. So uh, sending a save the date is always a good idea. Sometime around maybe March or April can remind people this is coming up. Sending an email during the giving window. Um, so saying, you know, it's open, click here, donate, here we go. Uh, sending an email or the early giving window, sorry. Sending an email at the start of the giving day. Here we go, it's time, we're all excited. And then send another one towards the end of the giving day for a final push. You know, we're at this much money, let's get over the finish line. I think it can be uh, easy to project your own anxieties and your own email preferences onto your audience and feel like, oh, I don't wanna bug them. Oh, I don't, but they're on your list. They want to hear from you. And if they don't, they'll unsubscribe. Uh, and you can also, you know, again, it's your, you're seeing how it goes, right? Um, if you're noticing that you lose a lot of people every time you send an email, you know, maybe pull back a little bit. But in the absence of like hard proof that your emails are doing something wrong, my advice always is, you know, go for it. Um, people appreciate what you do. They like to see what you're doing. And, uh, you know, a lot of folks, if they don't like it, they'll just delete it and move on with their day. It doesn't have to be a big deal. So that is sort of a general email stuff. Um, I'll pause again, Sarah, from we good? Do we have questions or anything? Uh, no questions on this. We did have a question on the early giving dates. Mm. Um, so I believe early giving uh, is August, sorry, not August, <laughs> April 25th. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Jane, for answering that. Um, and it ends right up until the second before the actual live event kicks off. Mm -hmm. And the Give Local website has resources. You can also look at the emails that NPCF sends. Uh, if you pull up NPCF emails from last Give Local, um, you can look at sort of emails explaining why would you give during early giving, what are the perks, um, that kind of thing. So yeah, that's the early giving window. All right, so I'm gonna keep going. Sarah, feel free to just like cut me off if someone has an urgent question. Uh, so social media, um, again, not everyone's got it. For those of you that do, I wanna give you some tips and best practices. Um, so generally speaking with social media, you want to be posting where your audience is. It sounds obvious, but it can be easier said than done. By that, I mean, Facebook has a certain demographic of users. Instagram has a certain demographic of users. TikTok, LinkedIn, um, email. These are all different demographics. And not only like, um, oh, older people tend to use this. Younger people tend to use that. But behavior wise too, right? So Instagram you're gonna get less uh, folks clicking links than Facebook, right? It's much easier to post a link to Facebook and have folks share it and click it than it is on Instagram. However, on Instagram, people are more likely to be spending money, for example. So e-commerce uh, is relative, is much more popular and successful on Instagram than on Facebook. Um, so this is something you can sort of Google um, about different, uh, demographics and different platforms and where folks are and what the trends are and that kind of thing. Um, free scheduling content, we touched on that earlier. Most social media platforms will let you do this. It's just a good idea. It makes it so that you don't have to be glued to your computer. You can just set it and forget it. Um, aim for early engagement. So again, going back to this idea of like, 
all year round, you're talking to folks. And I, I'll use the phrase training sometimes, training your audience to share your stuff, for example. Um, if you, throughout the year, are getting folks to share cute pictures of dogs, it's easier to get them to share a fundraising ask, uh, for example. Um, engage on the day of, that's sort of the, the biggest and best benefit, I think, of social media for Give Local is that unlike an email where you you can't email everyone every 10 minutes, that would be crazy. Uh, you can post on Facebook, I mean, not every 10 minutes, but you know what I mean. You can post much more frequently on social media than you can send emails. So uh, it's a good way to keep it, keep it feeling very alive. Like we're all in this exciting 24 hour blitz and we're posting and sharing and money's coming in and, um, create a, a story that people can kind of follow along with. And then just encourage sharing and post engagement. Way easier said than done. Uh, very contingent on your audience. This is another thing that you can use slower times of the year to sort of play with. Um, to just run experiments, see what kinds of posts get shared and what don't. Um, I've got some social media tools for nonprofits there in the sidebar. Mighty Claws uh, provided a bunch of those. Thank you. Um, but storylab.i will auto generate social media captions, which anyone who's managing social media knows can be a huge time uh, sink. Um, Canva is awesome. Uh, Canva.com will let you create um, really beautiful images. So really good for Instagram and Facebook in particular. You don't have to have a ton of background knowledge or anything like that. Um, Buffer.com will let you look at analytics. Uh, and then socialchamp.io is a social media scheduler. Socialchamp.io I haven't looked at lately. I assume it's still alive and active. Um, it may not be. And I assume, Sarah, there's like copies of this slideshow somewhere, right? People can access this little list after yep, the webinar. We're going to include it Great. in the toolkit once we're done. Awesome. Okay. So um, posting to socials, kind of with email, right? People want a magic bullet. There's not a magic bullet. It really depends on a million different variables. But there are some general good guidelines about what to post and when. So. Again, pre-event posting, right? Post to save the date, uh, post when the early giving window opens, and then there's the live event. So I, I personally think MPCF did a pretty good Facebook live feed last year. So you can look at their feed from last year's Give Local and see how that went. Um, but again, it's, it's a story. You're telling a story throughout the day that people want to follow and want to be involved with. So uh, if you've got time, if you've got resources, you could create posts and schedule posts with testimonials from folks that you've served and then say, if you want to make this happen, more of this happen, it just so happens to be Give Local Piedmont today, click here to donate. Um, or maybe your audience just wants to see funny pictures. So it's like, here's a funny picture, share it with your friends. And also it's Give Local Piedmont, click here to donate. Um, post at the beginning of the day when it kicks off. You can post um, milestone announcements. So if you hit a certain amount, um, make a post. Um, live matches. So when matching donations come in, post to announce that. Um, prize announcements, obviously, if you get a prize, you want to announce it. And then a post to let people know it's the final hour. Here we go. And that's the kind of thing you schedule in advance if you don't want to be up all night. Not all of us want to be up all night. So that is just a few sort of general guidelines about social posting, social media posting. Not all of us have social media. Not all of us have email. Totally fair. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about, for those of you that don't have social media accounts, ways to keep folks engaged, particularly on the day, on May 9th. Um, so one idea is reaching out to individuals, businesses, even other nonprofits, a little tricky, um, who do have social media feeds and see if they are willing to um, post about you. So you could, if you wanted to make it really low lift, 
You could create something for them. You could say, hey, here's a picture. Can you post it at this time? Here's a text post. Can you put this on Twitter at this time? Or if it's somebody that really likes you, uh, you could ask them to create something for you. Um, that's an idea. And that's something that, again, this is sort of, you can work on throughout the year. Um, volunteers, right? That could be a volunteer ask. Rather than ask your volunteers, for example, to give money, you could ask them to post about Give Local. Um, you could also, I should have written this down, I just thought of it. You could also, uh, if you're sending emails, um, but you don't have social media, you could ask, that could be the ask in an email. Um, if you can't donate, share, post about it. Here's the link to post on your social media feed. Um, if send emails and texts throughout the day, just manually, just hop on your own personal email address, send an email. Uh, even if it's just to your friends and family, just let them know that it's happening. Um, update them throughout the day via text or email about how it's going, um, giving them the link if they want to give. This last tip, maybe a little bit close to the, to the day, but I'm putting it out there, uh, you could host a little live event. You could invite folks to gather in a place where you've got a computer and internet access. You could put NPCF Facebook page up because that's going to be really lively um, and the give local Piedmont site up on another window um, have somebody refreshing them every now and then serve coffee something appropriate to your org um, juice food whatever not a low lift right event planning I don't want to just make it sound like oh just have an event but it's an idea um, for those of you that don't have social media feeds or email feeds, or for those of you that do, but that's just not where your folks are. Um, so particularly for folks with physical locations, I think that can be kind of a fun thing to do. Um, and of course, don't underestimate the power of real world uh, communication. So yard signs, stickers, uh, flyers that you can put up in public places. Um, particularly if you serve uh, folks that are gonna sort of maybe tend to be in a specific place, um, like a library or at a dog park if you're an animal shelter, um, that kind of thing, at a school, things like that. Um, posters, if, you, if your org has a physical location, you can put posters up in your location. Uh, you could also ask local businesses and see if they're willing to put posters up for you. A lot of people are uh, willing to do that. Um, business cards uh, can carry around little, this is just, you know, again, kind of maybe late for this one, but carry around business cards with your uh, date, your, the name of your org, the date, the URL for Give Local. If you're standing in line at Starbucks and you get into a conversation with somebody about your awesome um, you know, animal shelter, and they say, oh, that sounds so cool. You can, hey, we have a fundraising day coming up. Here you go. Um, can be surprisingly effective, just sort of always being ready to advertise your work to folks that you meet. And just word of mouth, just telling people that it's happening. Um, NPCF um, offers all of this stuff for free. Posters, stickers, print material, all this stuff as I was describing it, if you were like, I don't have time to make any of that stuff, you don't have to, NPCF made it. Uh, and there's multiple different pickup locations to make it easy for you to go get it. Um, so really take advantage of this. I, I would really take advantage of this. This is a really good uh, resource. And um, NPCF can also give you advice on places to post this stuff. Um, bumper stickers are great because then you're advertising everywhere you go. And uh, yeah, then they can help you with all that, all that strategy. Um, if you create your own print materials, one thing to always keep in mind is that this is a, a piece of paper that's asking someone to go to a website. So that's, it's a little bit of an ask. It's a bigger ask than clicking a link. So you wanna make it as easy as possible for someone to look at this print thing and go to your website. Um, QR codes are one way to do that. QR stands for quick response. Um, contrary to popular belief or common belief, you don't need a special app or anything to use a QR code. Take your phone, you open your camera, you hold it up like you're gonna take a picture of the QR code 
and the website comes up. So they are easier to use uh, than you may think. You can make QR codes for free online at qrcodegenerator.com. Um, there's a million free QR code generators, but that's a pretty like reputable established one. Test your QR codes before you make a zillion copies of them because you don't want to send people to the wrong place. Um, but yeah, those are QR codes. They're imperfect, but they're they're a really good solution as far as like if you want someone to go to a website from your poster, that is a way um, to do it. So I will pause one more time for questions. Any questions so far? I know I'm kind of like blah, 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 going fast. Oh, uh, let me check. Okay, Sarah. Um, this one was about um, some, well, maybe we can come back to this one uh, at the end. It's on social media, but this one says, would it be possible to add QR codes to the future postcard signs magnets that are given out? Good question. My short answer is gonna be yes, I think. Um, and I wanna answer for Jane and DB but I think that that's a good idea. And I know that a lot of that the upcoming print ads that NPCF is doing are gonna have QR codes on them, um, but adding them to the, the collateral that we give out, I think is, is a good idea. I can't think of any reason why not off the top of my head. It's a good idea. I'll keep that in mind. Um, so yes, good idea. Um, all right, so. <clears throat> Katie, I just answered uh, well, yeah. that in the um, in the chat, and I said that it is too late for us to print them on the postcards. We are not printing more postcards because now is about the time they should be in the mail. Um, but you mm -hmm. could put a sticker. You could print your own Q QR code, put a sticker on the postcard because we have room for stickers on those. Um, they are on the posters, and uh, Renard and I uh, plan to like totally umbrella all four counties with our posters um, so that they're in every business and everywhere and they're big and bright. Um, so absolutely next year we'll have them on the um, postcards and we have them, uh, the upcoming press that we have, they'll be on that as well. Mm -hmm. okay. Awesome. Thank yep. you, Jane. Yep. Cool. All right. Um, oh, awesome. We're almost actually almost at the end here. So um, the really uh, one very last one last very important step to any of this is saying thank you. Um, I'm gonna just broken record again, that this is like part of the sort of idea that this is a year round communication strategy, right? So um, <clears throat> after Give Local is over, you really wanna make sure to thank the folks that donated, of course. You also want to uh, thank folks um, who shared stuff on social media. So if you were really active on Facebook, you don't wanna just go silent. You want something up the next day saying, oh my God, thank you so much. Uh, here's how we did, it was so great. Couldn't have done it without you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, thank them for spreading the word about the fundraiser. Thank them for helping you reach your goal. Um, ideally, you want to do this as soon after the event as possible when everyone's still kind of following this, this wave with you, this narrative that you've created. Um, so what I will do is I'll write all that stuff ahead of time and I'll just leave blanks for like the amount raised. Um, and I'll have sort of maybe a couple versions for like one, if we did hit a publicized goal and another if we didn't maybe hit a publicized goal. And so that way I'm ready either way uh, and then get in there and send that out. Um, so again, the day after if possible. Um, and you can say thank you in a lot of ways. Um, this is again, another thing that it's time intensive but it can really be worth the investment. So you could create an image to say thank you using a tool like Canva or Adobe if you're creatively inclined. Um, you could make a little video of staff members or volunteers uh, or someone that you serve saying thank you. Um, and I think, again, this is where this like confidence comes in. I think sometimes it's tempting to be like, oh, who would watch? Who would care about that? Who would share that? These people would. They give you money, right? So like they, they like you. They like to see a video of you and your folks thanking them. 
um, your community cares about you and they appreciate the work that you do. And when you go in with that attitude, I think it can be like a self-fulfilling prophecy sometimes. Um, you can also use, again, testimonial from someone your org served. Testimonials are gold. Like gathering them throughout the year, having a folder of them can be a, just a huge return on investment that you can pull these out whenever you need them. Um, here's this uh, person who got a scholarship and then they got to go to college and they literally wouldn't have been able to do that if people didn't give money. So thank you. Here's what you did. This is what you made possible. Um, so huge uh, return on investment there for collecting testimonials. It can feel awkward. I'm sure there's like a whole other webinar on like ways to collect testimonials that could be done, um, but it's it's very, very valuable stuff. Um, and then the last tip is to do your thank yous where you did your asking. So if you were mostly on email, you wanna make sure that you're thanking people on email. If you were on social media, you wanna thank them on social media. If you were texting your friends, you wanna text them and say thank you, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, so those are, that is closing the loop. Telling a story, you don't want it to end abruptly. You want it to have a nice, you know, uh, moral of the story, happily ever after end. Um, so just to kind of sum up what I think are kind of the most important takeaways here. Uh, the first one is you can't get donations if you don't ask for them. Uh, it can, this can be, this can feel so weird and so hard and all that stuff. There can be so much anxiety around it, but it's, it's just, people are not just going to magically, um, donate to you. I mean, give local is very cool and unique in that sometimes people do, sometimes people go in there and they're like, I want to give to an animal shelter. Just find me one. And I'm going to give some money to them. Um, but it's, this is kind of the only time of the year that that really happens and uh, just don't be afraid to be doing this. Sort of along the same lines, if you don't have time for communication, um, this is always such a tricky like topic and a tricky thing to say, but it just may really be worth sitting down and looking at how we're allocating your time. And if there's anything that you can spend maybe less time and resources on, in favor of communications because it really, really, truly uh, can, can pay for itself. Um, and I think sometimes in nonprofits, especially, we get into habits and we spend time and resources on things because we feel like we should, we feel like we have to. Um, and when you really sit down and look and really this mindset of like, what is this doing for me? Uh, you can, sometimes you can discover places that you can cut down a little bit and invest a little bit more in communications um, because it can be really beneficial. And maybe next year you'll find that you now have time for everything, who knows? Um, the uh, next one is uh, just sort of about respecting your audience and about sort of demonstrating your value when you do ask for support. Um, and again, this is sort of this idea of what do you want people to do rather than what do you wanna say? You, you may wanna talk all about the intense need for your service, um, but people don't wanna throw money into a pit, right? So people wanna know there's a need, but if I give, I'll address it in this very concrete way, right? And I think that there's, that can kind of come down to just yeah, respecting your audience and understanding that they, understandably, they want to make an impact. They want to know that their money is going to do something. Um, so it's always good to demonstrate that value and sort of in two ways. One is when you're doing the asking by being very clear about what the money allows you to do. And then this other way, which is by throughout the year saying, we did this cool thing. We did that cool thing. We're out there. Da, 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 da. Um, and then again, this last thing about being guided by what you are, what you want your audience to do. 
uh, and not necessarily what you want to say. I'm not gonna be able to close that without my link. There we go. All right. Um, yeah, just can help you really focus in, not uh, babble on about stuff that uh, doesn't get people to give you money. Um, and it can be really clarifying in your other communications throughout the year too. It can be really clarifying for grant proposals. Um, it can just be clarifying in the way you talk about your work with other folks, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, and then just one thing that I haven't touched on that I'll, that I'll mention here about sort of throughout the year communication. Sometimes you, it's been a while, you wanna email folks and tell them that you did something cool, but you haven't. Maybe it's a slow year or maybe something went sideways or whatever. Um, you can always use current events that are relevant to your issue area to communicate with folks. Um, so if you can't communicate hard impact throughout the year, you can communicate that you're out there and you exist. Um, you can send an email about some news item and say your take on it or how you're gonna respond to it. Um, again, this year round communication thing, if you don't have numbers to share, you don't have numbers to share, it is what it is. It can be really valuable just for people to, to hear from you. And again, to, to not feel like they only hear from you one, at once a year in April, it's give local, here they are, you know. Um, so whatever you can do to communicate with folks throughout the year can be really valuable and, and worth doing. So, whew, <laughs> where are we on time? Oh, geez, oh, I went so fast. Okay, well. <laughs> Um, I think that is, that's the end of my slides. So happy to answer questions or elaborate on anything that came up. If there's anything in the chat. Um, I don't see anything in the chat right now. Um, we have about probably one minute left for questions. If anyone wants to throw one out real quick. Um, I'll also just plug the uh, nonprofit toolkit that's on the Give Local Piedmont site uh, filled with just a ton of great resources. Um, a ton of support articles. Mighty Cause has a bunch of ebooks on like social media and marketing tips. So if you're looking for more details, um, demographics, how to communicate your ask, messages like that, definitely check that out. Um, and then I know the uh, Give Local Piedmont team, they're always available to answer questions uh, directly with you. Good resources, Dee Dee and Jane, <laughs> Caitlin too, I'm sure. Um, and then if you have questions on the technical side of things, um, linking you know, your Instagram account or your uh, Facebook image gallery type of thing, you can always reach out to the Mighty Cause support and that's uh, support at mightycause.com. Um, yes, early giving window starts April 25th and it runs right up until the second before the live event kicks off on the 9th. Um, I think that's everything. Thank you, Caitlin. That was a, an awesome webinar. Lots of good content. Thank you all Thanks. so much. I really wish you all luck. And I, um, I know NPCF really appreciates all of you and everything you're out there doing. Um, and I know your the people you serve appreciate you as well. So I wish you all lots of luck. All right. Cool. Alrighty, sounds good. Bye, everyone. Thanks, y'all.